Do you hold knowledge dear? Do you value information in this information age? Or has the proliferation of it and everything else cheapened it all? Does it trouble you if this collective loses memory of its troubles, both recent and most remote? If we remain entertained, fed, and stuffed, and housed, and heated, and cooled, will that be enough? Does the thinking process depend upon a steady diet of useful knowledge? If so, must we eat our veggies, or is it enough to snack upon the sensations of the mind, dieting our noggins upon the delightful, but little upon the substantive? Ever wonder how it ends up? If, just if, history were to wither up, or reflect back a shallow and distorted mirror of approved, curated knowledge, comfortably conformative. It is time to pay attention. Pay attention before certain important things might just slip away, untraceable again. The books, the books, use them now before they fade away. I almost did this video several months back because when all this pandemic stuff was happening, along with everything else going on, um, the library shut down. And it's something that we use pretty routinely for research. And it's been one of the only ways to get detailed information on certain subjects and to really dig in. And so it's been important, especially at several intervals, especially when we're working on our feature films to do real research and really try to figure things out and to go to our closest federal depository library, which happens to be on a university campus. But of course, when universities started closing down, so did the libraries. And I guess just with everything going on, I didn't think people would be super focused on that because <laughs> that's just one of many aspects that everyone's suddenly dealing with. Well, here we are now basically six months into it, and the universities have started opening back up, but in a very limited, cautious way. A lot of the stuff is happening online. All right, that's what they're doing. And the libraries have opened back up, but with very limited hours and limited access. And it just so happens that they have cut off the library access to people who are not students, faculty, and staff which I happen to not be. I've had access as alumni. But even though I'm not happy with that, I understand that there's a lot of things going on with the COVID response. I really don't agree with hardly any of it, but I get that that's what they're doing. However, there's a little bit more than that. I don't know what's going on everywhere. Maybe you live in a place where it's different, but here in Texas, basically most places are open as far as stores you know, obviously grocery stores and most types of retail stores have been open for several months now. And while they make you wear a mask and everything, which I'm critical of, you know, you can physically go in, you can shop for goods, you can put them in your cart, you can touch them, you can put them back if you need to. And, you know, hopefully nobody's abusing that and doing weird, gross stuff. But the point is, people have been let back into their lives nearly everywhere, but not at the libraries. What do you need books for? I just want to study up on some things. And it turns out that one of the reasons this is happening is because most of the major libraries attached to universities across the entire country and possibly across the world have entered into an agreement with something known as the Haiti Trust. Uh, it looks like Hathi Trust, uh, but they say it's pronounced Haiti much like the country. And it's a reference to an elephant with the idea that an elephant never forgets, and so that's information in books. And, and the Haiti Trust is a digital library, and they become pretty much the major repository for scanned books, research materials, etc. And I, I think the, the vast majority, if not 100% of their materials, have all been scanned by Google, uh, which could prove to be important. But at any rate... At libraries like the ones I'm dealing with, whereas you used to be able to physically walk in, go to the shelves, or use their computer database, find the book. Um, for years now, you could click a button and have that 
book be ready to pick up at the desk, waiting for you, assigned to you, waiting to check out, check out with your library card, and you're on your way. They also, for many years, have had scanned books and documents, many of them from the Google sources, and you could just use those online. Pretty good deal. Point is, you had the chance to check them out. But now, many of the libraries, the one near me, is no longer allowing physical access to books. What they call the pick it up option, where you look up a book, decide you want it, click the button, have it waiting for you, is theoretically open, but only to students, faculty, and staff right now. Again, I understand. I don't agree, but I understand. Except that they now won't let you go physically into the library. You can't browse the stacks, which quite frankly has been very valuable many times. Um, have found a lot of stuff there that I wouldn't have found looking up. You can't do that. They've rolled it back to what they call the pick it up option, where you basically order the book and it's waiting for you at the desk and to keep people physically out of the libraries where there used to be, you know, considerable amount of people congregating. I don't know if a lot of them were really studying academically versus hanging out, but not the point. Now you can only pick the books up. Okay, fine. However, they now have an agreement because of the Hathi Trust that they may not lend any physical copies of books that the Haiti Trust has in their digital collection. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? What'd you need books for? I just want to study up on some things. They now have an agreement through the Haiti Trust and because of their participation in the Haiti Trust, which uh, generally speaking has knitted together a network of primarily universities across the country using this because they're allowing access to their digital collections. They are no longer allowing physical copies of books to be lent out to the library. It isn't that my local university library themselves have decided it's not a good idea to lend out physical books. Although, um, they're delivering mail and packages and boxes on a daily basis, and they've told the country that this thing won't be spread that way, and it's fine to get your mail and your packages, but they've somehow decided books are an issue. Yeah, books, always spreading the plague. Books, always an epidemic, right? But now, they may not lend out physical copies of books that have been scanned by this Haiti Trust digital library collection. And that definitely gives me pause. Now, before I go any further, I would say there's a lot of good things about the Haiti Digital Library. In theory, they're trying to scan endless physical libraries, some of which hasn't been touched by people in years and years and years. And I know because I've checked out books that have not been read by anyone in 50 or 80 years in some cases. Um, it's great that they are scanning those and making them available to read in full. They have the OCR thing on, so you could search for words, you could find your key terms, and you could go to immediately where that is in the text. And that's all great. That is revolutionary and could be very useful to the general education and enlightenment of the population, if you will. However, <laughs> they're not making these books available to the general public, even though probably about a third of their collection completely public domain, books that are so old, no one could even possibly have a claim against them, and other books that because they're for academic research probably really wouldn't be subject to any copyright claims, and it's all in theory anyway. Nonetheless, this Haiti Trust is not, as far as I can understand from reading it and looking at their agreements, not open to the general public. It's open only uh, two members of these various universities who have to have credentials and IDs, right? So I like the fact that they have these digital scans available and I got access to it. I've already found a lot of interesting stuff. It is a value in of itself, but the fact that their agreement is preventing physical checkouts of books does give me great pause for alarm. And I really... I had that feeling creep up in my stomach. I was really uncomfortable and just 
kind of perplexed as to why they were doing it. Uh, I had a feeling of foreboding, knowing that actually there's been a lot of warnings about this. And a lot of people seem to know that this day was coming. And here it seems to be. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just telling you, I got creeped out. And I know on the one hand, it looks good that this collection has millions and millions of books and you can download it and search it and all that stuff. I get that that's useful. But on the other hand, it really feels like they're restricting information. On its surface, I can't understand any reason why a digital collection should feel itself jealous or in competition with physical checkouts of books, which, quite frankly, I don't think are all that plentiful these days anyway. But I looked into it a little bit, and since all this COVID stuff has gone through, since universities and libraries have been generally closed for the last six months or so, um, the Haiti Trust Digital Library and hundreds of universities have all signed on to what they're calling an Emergency Temporary Access Service Agreement. And this went through August 6, 2020, or at least it was updated then. And they're saying that this emergency temporary access agreement is due to the unexpected disruption from this pandemic and the fact that they're not letting people into libraries with books of all things, but you go to grocery stores, you go to retail stores, you go out in public, but with a mask, you know, you can't just go into a library with a mask. The books are tainted just as it is. So since this is an unprecedented emergency of books, uh, they have made it allowable for all these universities to have their students, staff, and faculty log in and search these with the proviso that they may not check out any physical books to any students, faculty, or staff. What do you need books for? I just want to study up on some things. Why? Well, supposedly they've interpreted it that that somehow protects them on copyright because they have copyrighted materials amongst their materials and their collection, and because they could potentially be sued by someone who says that's not all right. They've made what I find to be very strange, an agreement with these universities that is a one-for-one. One. Uh, if there's a title and that library has one copy of it, one student faculty or staff from their domain may log in and use that book at a time. And if another student has a report on the same book or something like that, they have to wait in line to get access to the book until the other person's done using it and they're limited to an hour, uh, so on and so forth. It's a one-to-one -one copy on the member library shelf. One individual access to the digital copy. Uh, and if there's two copies on the shelf, then two users from that university can use it at a time. Lovely concept since obviously... One of the promises of this digital world is that information is mirrored. It's copied an infinite number of times. You don't even have to run a copy through a copy machine. You don't have to have someone sit there and write it out. There's no cost involved. These files, once they're up there, can be distributed almost an infinite number of time only with respect to the servers, right? So why are they limiting the number of copies that could be accessed to the physical books? I find it really strange. And they're saying that it has some something to do with protecting their copyright. And so lending a physical copy of a book from a library that was set up to give the public access to books and to allow interested parties to come in and peruse materials under some basic general, you know, guidelines has been suspended. <laughs> Pretty incredible that this has been a priority uh, at this time, with everything else going on in this supposed pandemic, you can get packages, you can get mail, not a problem. But getting a physical book, uh, apparently, that's a showstopper. And it turns out this is all the way that the Haiti Trust Agreement has set it up. They say these services are at their sole discretion, it's based on a fair use analysis and implementation of their understanding of the access to copyright law. And they say they will uh, evaluate each university's library's ability uh, to basically work within their system. 
So again, they're saying this is based on their system to protect them under copyright law, but they're actually preventing individual physical libraries from lending out the books they've collected, in some cases over more than a century, to make available to the public for the general uh, opportunity to educate and inform people, help them with research. And I, I really wonder if that's not a violation of copyright to prevent a properly acquired book, either purchased or acquired, under the copyright of a book that's published and distributed in such a way to prevent that from being lended out at a library. Very weird, but of course, these individual libraries have agreed to it. And it gives me concern for several reasons, you know. First of all, because it kind of goes against public interest. And second of all, it just seems unnecessary and therefore a little bit suspicious because it feels like someone trying to have a monopoly over information. You know, it's one thing to scan a bunch of books and say, now here they are, here they are available. And it's one thing to treat some books that are still under copyright, you know, in a reasonable manner, but a lot of the other books in the public domain. So why aren't they just accessible? And why are they preventing libraries from lending out physical copies of books, uh, including ones that are in the public domain and have been for a long time, they're preventing those from being lended out. And, you know, it's eerily familiar to a lot of the warnings, you know. It brings up thoughts of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, of the real-life book burnings that have taken place. It brings to mind, you know, the shameful, tragic, deliberate event. Oh, I'm sorry, it's supposedly accidental, of the burning of Library of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. There's more information available today and more advanced technology to preserve it though we can't know for sure that our digital archives will be more resistant to destruction than Alexandria's ink and paper scrolls. The biggest is in Geneva. That's a nice place to visit. Yeah. I guess that's where all the books are now. Yeah, well, thank you. And even if our reservoirs of knowledge are physically secure, they will still have to resist the more insidious forces that tore the library apart. Fear of knowledge and the arrogant belief that the past is obsolete. And it calls to mind the movie Rollerball, which I'm not sure if a lot of people have seen. It's got James Caan, uh, some other well-known people. And on the surface, it's a movie about sports, a very violent rollerball sports. And James Caan, the lead character, is the best player in this league. It's meant to entertain and basically pacify the public. But the thing is, James Caan begins to begins to get interested in how the society works. So he begins to seek information, and attempt to do research. So, of course, he goes to his local library. Do you know how many books were published in this country once upon a time when there was paper and power and presses that worked? And, and what does he find in this movie Rollerball about sports, about the library? Well, he finds that they have stubs of information. There must be some mistake. The books you've ordered are classified and have been transcribed and summarized. Well, who summarizes it? I suppose the computer summarizes it. <laughs> and um, he asks a couple questions along his line of inquiry and obviously isn't satisfied because the librarian there, so-called, is um, not aware of this information, can't give him any additional information. You could go to the computer center where the real librarians transcribe the books, but we have all the edited versions in our catalog. Anything I think you'd want. Well, let's see then. This is not... A library and you're really not a librarian i'm only a clerk that's a little bit right. like wikipedia or something right a good place maybe to start with a general inquiry but in of itself not really thorough enough to say you know something to say you understand why what'd you need books for i just want to study up on some things well let's see then so this is not really a library and you're really not a librarian are you a librarian <laughs> no no, I'm just a B character placed here to illustrate how vapid a dystopic society becomes when information is systematically censored and withheld from the people. And it turns out that all the books have been centralized, gathered, and destroyed after they were digitized into a computer. Ask anything. You found it for you. Section of the box. Well, choose the other. And 
He keeps asking questions and goes to the place where the computer's centrally located that has the books stored in its system. Not many people come to see us, you know. We're not easy to talk to, Zero and I. And he finds out that, lo and behold, this computer has apparently accidentally lost the entire 13th century of digitized information. Hmm. But we lost those computers with all of the 13th century. No big loss, says the scientist of the computer, because, you know, it was just Dante and some other obscure things. Distracting and annoying. Well, that in itself would be a pretty big loss. But what's worse, when he tries to ask questions about what he's inquiring about, how decisions are made in his society, um, the computer which talks, is extremely vague. Everything we ask has become so, ah, so complicated now. And basically is either unwilling or unable to provide him with the information he seeks. Sierra, you heard the question. Answer him. Negative. You don't have to give him a full political briefing. Answer. Negative. He's become so ambiguous now, as if he knows nothing at all. The books are not available anywhere. They've been destroyed, and some of the information's been destroyed. What about the books? Books, books, oh no, they're all changed, all transcribed, all information's here. We've zero, of course. He's the central brain, the world's brain. You know, this is creepy stuff, all right? And... The warning signs have been all around us in culture that information is power. I think Francis Bacon said that. Information, therefore, is scattered and has to be sought out. But again, libraries, collections of information written and otherwise, have been gathered publicly so that someone who wants to know at least has some opportunity to find out. A memory pool, you see? He's supposed to tell us where things are and what they might possibly mean. But in certain dystopic futures, and apparently in our own actual reality, you can't just go get that physical book. Tell me, how does that qualify as knowledge? Sorry, that's all I've got. A scripted response is just floating around, bouncing off my skull in the empty cavity where my critical thinking skills should have been. What'd you need books for? study up on some things. So I know some people are saying, well, what's wrong with the Haiti Trust? They've done a pretty good job. They've got millions of stuff you can get in there. Well, I can because I have university access, but a lot of other people can't because they don't have university access. So they're locked out of that, first of all. And second of all, we can hope that these are faithful scans, but there might be reason to compare it to the physical book. And quite frankly, I personally like holding a physical book. I can't really stand to read information for long periods of time off of a computer screen. So I will, for better or for worse, not be very likely to sit and read, say, a whole book online, even if it's freely before me, even if it's in the public domain, in a nice searchable PDF. I will definitely search for some information. I might find some stuff that helps me and is useful, but it's not really the place I want to sit and read. I really treasure physical books for that. And I hope a lot of other people do. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Frankly, I think people have been neglecting their time at the library for generations now. But I'm not here to scold anyone. I'm just saying you might want to pay attention to what's happening here. Do you know how many books were published in this country once upon a time when there was paper and power and presses that worked and a project that is acting as if it is freeing information and making it widely available to people is now actively restricting information at major public universities, I would say both public and private universities, who are part of this Haiti Trust. And probably their intentions are good. Hopefully. Let's hope so. But all their scanned material comes from Google, the very company that has been repeatedly accused of manipulating search results, hiding sensitive information, hiding politically divisive information, using algorithms that help to spread false information, manipulating search results, burying information. 
Uh, they've investigated it. They looked into it. There's lots of angles to it. I'm not focusing on just one aspect of it, but you know, let's just say we're only talking about elections. <laughs> you know, Google's algorithm has been shown to be able to sway such elections. A senior research psychologist named Dr. Robert Epstein of the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology he was a former editor in chief of Psychology Today, and he came out and said how Google could rig the election because they have the ability to drive millions of votes to a candidate and no one would know. And it has to do with search engine bias, how Google's algorithm serves up the search results, because how Google ranks its search results determine what people are going to see first, which is pretty basic. And quite frankly, if you type in some politically sensitive uh, search terms, buzz terms, uh, Melissa demonstrated this before in another video, and you go to Google, you get one set of results. But if you go to, say, DuckDuckGo, which I've gotten more in the habit of using, you get totally different results. Pretty weird. And let's type in Hillary Clinton. So on DuckDuckGo, when you type in Hillary Clinton, the third thing that you get is indictment. The fourth thing that you get is email scandal. You also get concession speech. Okay? So that's what you get on DuckDuckGo. Now let's try it on Yahoo. Mm, same thing, pretty much. Indictment, email scandal, same thing. Concession speech. You also get illness. Well, let's try Hillary Clinton on Google. Okay. Right away, you can see a huge difference here. There is absolutely nothing that comes up in these search results that suggests anything potentially negative or that could be viewed as in a negative light about Hillary Clinton. Okay, so if I go to DuckDuckGo when I type in hate speech, I get First Amendment, laws, hate speech versus free speech, examples, meaning, legal definition. Now let's try Google. Okay, as you can see, there's a difference here right away. Um, hate speech is illegal and hate speech on college campuses which is not something I got in any other search. So in DuckDuckGo, I get anti-vaxxers, anti-vaxxer definition, movement, meaning, memes, ideology. That was pretty basic, right? Check out what you get on Google. Okay, so right away we have anti-vaxxers on the magic school bus. Let's check that one out. So that is college humor making a joke about the stupidity of anti-vaccine parents. Pretty weird. Anyway, we can hope everyone here has good intentions. I'm not saying that the Haiti Trust doesn't have good intentions. I think it's cool that they have a digital library, but their behavior already at this point in time of locking down and restricting that information and making the key part of their agreement that universities not be allowed to lend out their physical collections um, should be a little bit disturbing to you. I really think so. And it's worth pointing out that Google Books, being such an important partner of the Haiti Trust, has some serious scanning and metadata issues. And this is criticism that dates back to 2009 and 2010, but the problem is still rolling forward and I'm not really sure it's been corrected. A scholar named Jeffrey Nunberg conducted a study with 400 randomly selected Google Books and found an error rate of 36% in the metadata errors, attributing the wrong year, the wrong century, the wrong subject, the wrong keywords. Jeffrey Nunberg noticed that a search for books published before 1950 and containing the word internet turned up an unlikely 527 times. Woody Allen is mentioned in 325 books before he was born. 182 for Charles Dickens before his birth, incorrect classifications, Moby Dick being listed as a computer book, Mae West, the uh, silent film actress, uh, her biography listed under religion, uh, conflicting classifications, 10 different editions of Whitman's Leaves of Grass classified both as fiction and nonfiction and all kinds of other subcategories. And then there's all the misspelled titles, authors and publishers, stuff like Moby Dick and the White Wall, just for example. The overall error rate of 36.75% found in the study suggests Google Books metadata has 
a high rate of error. It doesn't distinguish between major and minor errors, but the point is all of it affects findability. And if you can't find it, it's not that much different from a complete book being lost in the algorithm like some kind of politically incorrect website. What happens when someone doesn't want you to find that information? And what happens when it's just a mistake, but it's still unfindable? Salon.com interviewed Jeffrey Nunberg and discussed some of the serious problems with the bibliographic information attached to many of the digital text in Google Books. Quote, Google Books was conceived of in two ways. The first is a new library. I call it the last library, an aggregate of all the libraries in the world. If this is really the last library, as I put it, and no one is going to go back and do all this scanning again, which I think we can all agree is probably the case, then it's really important that it be done right, and it's going to cost a lot of money to do it. Jeffrey Nunberg stated, Then there are problems with the scanning itself. I was researching the history of the word CAD and got a result of the transactions of the Philological Society from the late 19th century challenging the OED definition. But I can't read the first four pages of it because all four pages are bunched together and then there's someone's thumb in the image. Now, no one's going to go back and rescan those pages. It would cost more than scanning the whole shelf. So that's it. As far as the digital collection is concerned, those pages are lost. I could find them by going to the Bodleian Library in Oxford, England, and ask them to pull it out of whatever deep storage they have it in, but realistically, I'm not going to do that. It's too difficult to get to. He's underscoring the problem that any mistakes that are happening in the Google Book scans and the Haiti Trust scans, their giant collections, uh, is pretty much irreversible. Basically, you're talking about corrupted knowledge. Maybe a small percentage, but you never know what's going to make a difference. You just don't know. Again, Google has been in question. They are what they are, but quite frankly, they already have way too much power. And no one entity, no business, no government agency, no digital collection should be able to concentrate information or power or access um, all to itself, you know. And at a certain point, <laughs> it's scary. And Google's been past the creepy line, well, for many years now. And I'm not going to get into that whole issue, but in many ways, uh, they're involved in what I'm starting to see as kind of a monopolizing of information. Now, Jeffrey Nunberg wrote his own article about Google's book search and called it a disaster for scholars. He said, Google's book search is clearly on track to become the world's largest digital library, no less important, and it is almost certain to be the last one. Google's five-year head start and relationships with libraries and publishers give it an effective monopoly. No competitor will be able to come after it on the same scale, nor is technology going to lower the cost of entry. Scanning will always be an expensive, labor-intensive project. Of course, 50 or 100 years from now, control of the collection may pass from Google to someone else. El Civier, UNESCO, Walmart... But it's safe to assume that the digitized books that scholars will be working with then will be the very same ones that are sitting on Google's servers today, augmented by the millions of titles published in the interim. And what assurances do we have that Google will do this right? Now, overall, Jeffrey Nunberg found that the metadata errors based on incorrect scan dates makes research using the Google Books Project database difficult, and Google has shown only limited interest in cleaning up the errors. So what happens if the research can't happen the way it's supposed to? It's not going to be pretty, all right? Um, there are agreements with universities besides not lending the physical books, which apparently seems to be the main proviso of their agreement, and the universities being afraid to be cut off are strictly enforcing it and making sure that they follow that to the T, well, besides that, you know, the access of individual universities to their giant digital book database isn't just in good faith because 
Some places are physically restricted right now, and there's an emergency situation going on. So information, because it's contagious, has to be logged down. You know, they're basing the participation of these universities on how well they can accurately identify students, faculty, and staff who are logging in and using this information. Okay, maybe in some ways that's just basic, and that's the way it is these days with an authorization and a login, and they got to make sure the wrong people don't get in because the copyright, someone's going to sue them for letting someone read a book. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, I've gone through this thing. I, I found some interesting material, and, and I was able to look at it and everything. But when you do it, it logs a unique number tied to your ID number at that university, and they know exactly who's looking at that information. And if it were to be distributed online, if someone else were to read it, and that information became contagious, uh, they would know exactly what the source of that unauthorized distribution was. Okay, all right, maybe there's some good reasons for doing that, but well, you should probably think about that. And the libraries before this point have been known you know, to keep databases of what their members have checked out on their library cards. I remember being told back in grade school, they keep a list of everything you read. So if you read the most controversial stuff, they're going to know and you'll be on a list for life. I don't know. Maybe it's true. But at the same time, most libraries I've been at, you can go into during their hours and you can go to the shelves. You can get a book. You can go to a table. You can find a quiet corner and you can read it. You can put it back on the shelf and leave and nobody has to know what you read. Why should they? It's reading. It just basically benefits you and society generally. And there's no reason really to restrict it. Yeah, authors who've worked hard on their books should have a fair opportunity to get paid for it. But I, I really think they've twisted that copyright law as a way of restricting our access to that information. And yes, it would be reasonable, I suppose, that if I wanted to take that book out of the library with me, that it makes sense that the library would, you know, scan my library card and make note that I am the one who checked out the book. Because after all, I'm on the hook for it. And if it's lost or damaged or stolen, then I'll be the one that has to pay for it. All right. It makes sense. But that's not really what they're doing here. Again, Haiti Trust, who's putting all these provisos on university access and the individuals, if they're lucky enough to be part of that university at this time, um, they're taking information that was scanned for free by Google in total without paying the respective copyright authors for their books individually. They've just scanned them whole, put them in their database, and now they want to be in a position to track which individuals and which institutions are accessing that information and tracking where it spreads and blocking and gatekeeping access to that information. Of course, these are strange times and it's an emergency and we have to do everything we can. And second to COVID only, we just really would hate to see information spread. So beware everyone. But I will draw your attention to the clip in Zardos where Sean Connery's character, a warrior who knows little about his society, suddenly finds himself in an abandoned library and discovers a little book called Wizard of Oz that clues him in on some of the secrets of power and the way in which power has veiled itself. Don't you remember the man in the library said? It was I who led you to the Wizard of Oz book. It was I. I prayed you. I led you. And I have looked into the face of the force that put the idea in your mind. You're bred and led yourself. And I think it would be well if everyone gave some thought to the signs and omens that there's an attempt to restrict information. Because, quite frankly... <laughs> We're supposed to be putting more and more and more of our trust and power and authority in these digital systems, these social media platforms, and they've already showed us how little regard they have for free speech. How many things really are dangerous to say in contrast with the danger of not being able to say those things? Pretty short list, people.
So why are they really doing it? Google and these other major tech corporations are now entering into the arena of becoming arbiters of truth, arbiters of what is going to be allowed to be talked about on their platforms and what isn't. Now, there is a quote from Sergey Brin from the beginning of Google, uh, co-founder of Google, uh, back at the start of their secret books project, where he said, quote, we just feel this is part of our core mission. There's fantastic information in books. Often when I do a search, what's in a book is miles ahead of what I find on a website, end quote. Now, I agree completely with the sentiment of that quote, and it's all the more reason that making physical books inaccessible is really upsetting and really off-putting, even if this proves to be temporary. Although we don't really know technically that this will be temporary. This might just be the beginning of the phase when you can't access physical books in a library anymore. Hopefully not. Hopefully that's going to swing back the other way. But right now, they are restricting access to the physical collections. Why? Are they restricting information and agreeing to suspend the physical checking out of books? Since when did that make someone sick <laughs> or contagious? Uh-huh. Something smells rotten in the state of Denmark. And I guess I'm going to leave it at that for now. Thanks for listening. We have more stuff on the way. This is just kind of a quick rant. Um, although that actually did happen. Obviously it's symbolic, it works on both levels. Uh, I don't want to tell you too much, don't want to spoil the film, uh, but I'll just say Icarus, okay? If you know what I mean, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. But you should probably read more. But you should probably read more. What do you need books for? Tell me, how does that qualify as knowledge? Sorry, that's all I've got. A scripted response is just floating around, bouncing off my skull in the empty cavity where my critical thinking skills should have been. <laughs>